Excellent. So we have uh, two presenters today. So we have Susie Richmond, who's in the background helping with answering questions, and you may see her on a video or two over the course of our many events. She is the Executive Director of Neighborhood Cats, having served in the role since 2010. She oversees hands-on TNR programs in New York City, Jersey City, and on the island of Maui, as well as using her prior Madison Avenue ex advertising experience to write, among other things, crowdfunding appeals to help the many sick and injured cats who come to Neighborhood Cats in, who come neighborhood cats way one of her favorite projects currently is a veterinary scholarship program designed to train community cat oriented vets on high volume spay neuter techniques um, and when you when she's not in the office you can find susie out in the fields of maui where she recently passed the hundred uh, thousand cats trapped mark and um, susie and brian both have had to uh, prioritize and they are in Maui working in the burn zone quite a bit. So much of their work is focused in that area and has been for the last several months. And we have Brian Cordes who serves as the Neighborhood Cats National Program Director and Susie Richmond's husband back in 1999 while working in Manhattan as both an attorney and a video director. Brian co-founded Neighborhood Cats after TNRing a colony near where he lived. Except for a six-year stint as a grants manager for PetSmart Charities, he has been with the organization ever since. He's authored or co-authored handbooks on grassroots TNR, community TNR, and return to field programs. And you can always find him online where he regularly presents both ba basic and advanced webinars on all things trap, neuter, return in partnership with the Community Cats podcast. All right. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Okay, thank you so much, Stacy, and thanks everybody for taking time out to learn more about how to care for care for our community cats. I uh, just want to mention again that one of the handouts uh, um, is today's slides, and they have all the all the links on the slides are live, so you can just kind of kick back and watch, and not be worrying about uh, scrambling it, uh, to take notes and copy links and things like that. So let's get into colony caretaking and um, what that involves. And of course, I think the first thing to recognize when we talk about uh, being a caretaker is that the bond between you and the cats is primarily focused around food. Not that there aren't other, other aspects of it that can be just as strong, but initially, and then throughout um, the time that you're caring for the colony, food is going to form the, the central part of your relationship. Um, cats, community cats are not wild animals in the sense that they um, subsist on their own. Now there are, there are in the United States, there are some who you can find like in the forests um, of Kauai in Hawaii, for example, or maybe some other um, wilderness areas where the cats are uh, living, you know, strictly by predation. But in the United States, anyway, the vast, vast 99.999% of these cats are not um, living by predation alone, and they have a link to some type of human-based food source. So whether it's a feeder who comes by every day or um, a dumpster behind the supermarket, whatever it might be, there's a link to humans. And that reliance on us for food is what ends up forming uh, the bond um, for them. So we're going to spend a fair amount of time, the first half of this webinar, uh, talking about food and feeding and all the different aspects of it. And then um, we'll have a break and then we'll come back and talk about other aspects of um, caretaking as well. So let's get into um, feeding. And the first thing to understand um, in terms of really optimizing your, your work as a caretaker is that you're much better off if the cats have a feeding pattern. And that means um, uh, the cats are feeding as close as possible to the same time, same place on a, on a daily basis. And if you keep, keep in mind, like every, I'm sure most of you have pet cats, and they're they're very habitual creatures. So if they're used to eating at uh, you know 7 a.m. every morning, you know good luck uh, sleeping in late, right? Because they're not going to let you. Um, they want their food when they're used to getting it. And outdoor cats are exactly the same. And 
So it's not hard to get them on a pattern. If you feed them at um, 8.30 a.m. every morning, they're going to learn within a week or two that that's when the food appears. And um, especially if the food doesn't stay out all day, they'll be even more motivated to show up at that time. And this has all sorts of advantages in terms of um, uh, trapping, for example. If you have newcomers, you're going to know where they're going to be and when they're going to be there. Um, has implications for managing wildlife, uh, you know, not attracting rodents, things like that. But so if you if you can't um, do it at the exact same time every day, then try to keep it to um, a section of the day. So always feed them in the morning or always feed them at dusk or always feed them when you get home uh, or as close to that as the, the any kind of pattern is better than no pattern. And um, you don't want to leave food out 24 seven because then it's completely random uh, when they come and, and it can be very difficult uh, to monitor them and, and to trap them if you need to. Also try to develop a sound that they associate with you when you come to feed. And often the cats do that on their own. Like they can distinguish the sound of different car engines. So we've seen this repeatedly, like where the, we drive up to a location and see nothing. And then five minutes later, the caretaker shows up in her pickup truck and the cats come running out because they recognize the sound um, and they recognize the visuals as well. So, you know, get a clicker or uh, do a special whistle or jingle your keys or shake your jar of crunchies, whatever it might be. Get them to associate a sound. And this will help you also to um, if you need to trap, because uh, if, if they're being uh, at all hesitant, um, you can you can use that sound to draw them out. So feeding patterns, real super important. So. Um, what you want to avoid uh, is attracting wildlife. Um, if you're in an area where there is some, and that's almost everywhere, you could be in the middle of Manhattan and attracting raccoons. Um, so in order to do that, and, and that can cause a lot of issues, right? With um, people not, you know, saying, you're, well, you're feeding the cats and, and, and I've got raccoons in my backyard or coyotes or whatever it might be. So um, if you feed uh, during daylight, most wildlife is nocturnal, and you can avoid most wildlife issues if you feed during the day. So you would set your pattern up for daylight. Now, on the other hand, if you're dealing with birds, like here in Hawaii, there are feral chickens all over the place, and um, very few mammals, and, and none uh, that would compete with the cats, except for maybe mongoose. Um, but birds and mongoose are diurnal, meaning they only come out in the daytime. They go to sleep as soon as it gets dark. So most caretakers around here feed their cats um, after dusk. And in that way, they avoid uh, attracting um, wildlife. And again, the same idea, um, don't leave food out at, at all times and um, keep, keep the feeding area clean even if it's not your garbage, you know, clean it up so that there isn't food left out for wildlife to find. Now, um, you know, sometimes you you get into situations where the rac, you know, maybe raccoons or, or wildlife are out during the day, or um, for whatever reason, um, you can't establish a feeding pattern or whatever it might be. Here's one very clever way to um, feed your cats and not feed the raccoons or the opossum or the skunks. And it's called a raccoon proof feeder. And you can see in this uh, slide here, this is from um, the plans are from Forgotten Felines of Foresight. If you click on that link, it should take you to them. Uh, it's obviously pretty, pretty simple uh, construction, but basically it's a platform that is um, raised up uh, several, a few feet off the ground, and the platform has a, a metal flashing around it. So it's impossible for an animal to climb up the pole and then grab onto the platform and pull themselves up. But meanwhile, the cats can jump that high 
get up onto the platform, which in this photo um, has a little covered feeding area um, to protect it from rain and things like that. You'll also notice on the right, on the ground, there's what's called a little uh, jumping station. And that you know gives the cats a little bit of an extra boost. Maybe you've got some seniors and they can't jump quite as high as uh, the younger cats. So um, giving them a little place to jump up from uh, will help them get up. So raccoons and, and those types of animals, they can jump, but they can't jump up. <clears throat> they can jump across. So this this will um, solve that problem for you. So again, that's that's one kind of um, pretty clever way to avoid those issues. So what if you have um, wildlife that comes at night and you have birds who come during? Well, the way we have sol found to solve that problem is what with what we call bird proof. Uh, feeding stations. And it's really quite simple, uh, as you can see in this photo. Uh, the birds, um, are not, they're not really afraid of the cats, but they, uh, so they'll walk right into a feeding station, even if they know there are cats around. But they don't like to go through these plastic strips. So if you take some heavy duty plastic, like um, maybe three millimeters thick and you can get a drop cloth at your local hardware store. You know, cut off a piece of it, uh, use duct tape to attach it to the front of your feeding station over the doorway and cut it in strips. So the cats have no problem with this. They just they just brush right through it. But the birds, most birds will not um, pass through these plastic uh, strips. It's not 100 percent, but um, we have found that it's um, most times it's uh, pretty uh, successful. Uh, another thing to do um, that we found, like um, we're we're feeding hundreds of cats in the in the Maui burn zone, and there's a ton of chickens all over the place now. They've repopulated. Well, we find if we if there's a large um, concentration of the chickens, if we just give them some food like cracked corn, stuff that the cats would eat, uh, then they're they're satisfied and they tend to leave the feeding stations alone. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what kind of food you're to feed, because um, we're we're often asked that you know for our recommendations, and uh, it's first it, bef before we get into that kind of guidance, it's kind of important to know, um, to be able to evaluate the nutritional quality of, of a food. Now that there are pet food experts out there who um, know far, far more than I do. And um, there, there are books you can read and you can really educate yourself about this a lot. But if you're looking for just some very basic guidelines, what you want to do is the first thing you want to do is look at the ingredients label like you see on the back of this can. This was a, a brand uh, called Pet Guard, which I don't think is in, unfortunately is not in production anymore. But the ingredients label will list the ingredients in the order of their volume. So when you look at this ingredient lab, uh, label, you see that beef, uh, beef broth, chicken liver, kidney, those are the largest uh, amount of the, they're the largest percentage of the ingredients. That's a good thing because cats are, are carnivores and they need meat. So if you look at the ingredients label and um, the first thing you see is cornmeal or some type of grain, well, that's not going to be as nutritious as uh, a food that has uh, meat as the primary ingredient. So that's a basic guideline there. Uh, now, it's, it, you know, the more meat there is and the better the quality of the food, the more expensive it is. So there's that to take into account too. You do get what you pay for. That's just the reality. There are some good values and we'll talk about those. But um, in general, if you want um, you want something like organic meat and you want the meat to be, you know, um, there to be no uh, grains at all and uh, just very, very high quality, uh, that's going to definitely be a lot costlier than your supermarket brands, which um, 
may have more grains or things called um, meat byproducts. So a meat byproduct, for example, might be the feathers from a chicken, right? Doesn't mean um, it's the actual meat. So um, whole meat is, is your best ingredient. And here are some, some websites and, and an, an excellent uh, book um, by one of our board members, Anitra Frazier, called The Natural Cat, which uh, is, will, if you go through, read these or, or check out these sites, you'll just get a tremendous amount of information about what kind of foods are nutritious and which are not. Another thing to take into consideration when we're talking about nutrition is the whole wet versus dry um, uh, kind of, um, well, I, I don't want to say debate, but, uh, you know, the, there's obviously there's dry cat food and then there's wet cat food. And so the first thing I do when, when I talk about this is I, you know, I'm, I'm vegan, so this slide is, is hard for me, <laughs> but it, it illustrates the point really well. So on, on your left, you've got a, a, a nice juicy steak, right? Um, and on your right, you have that same piece of meat um, baked to a crisp. So if you were eating for yourself, which one do you think would be more nutritious? So obviously the uh, meat that is not um, baked to the point where it's solid is going to be healthier for you, right? Um, now it gets trickier too with cat food because you get, um, you have a lot of added, uh, bec because um, the meat is not complete in itself. They, there's a lot of uh, amino acids and vitamins and things like that that are added to the meat. Um, now, your cheaper dry foods add all these ingredients before the baking process. As a result, a lot of them are destroyed, right? Um, your more expensive and higher quality brands of cat food will add these ingredients after the baking process, which is a more laborious um, and complicated process, hence the price is um, somewhat higher. Now, sometimes people wonder about, well, you know, is a higher quality of dry food better than a lower quality of wet food? That gets really complicated. And, and this idea that the canned food is is healthier than the dry food really only applies when you're talking about the same brand. So if you can get Purina canned food versus Purina dry food, the canned food's going to be healthier. But whether Purina um, wet food is better than Blue Buffalo dry food, that that's a whole different uh, question, which which is you you need to kind of really know your stuff to answer that, and I don't know it well enough. So. I can't. Um, that just takes more more research. So when you take all this into account, um, you know, cost and um, ingredients and wet versus dry, what we advise caretakers to do is choose the best quality and type of food that you can comfortably afford. So that takes two very important things into account. One is that idea that nutrition matters. So the healthier the food that the cats get, the healthier they're going to be. On the other hand, uh, your budget and your wallet also are just as important. And we don't want, you know, people going out there, you know, spending their whole Social Security check on the highest quality canned food and then leaving nothing for themselves and struggling uh, financially. That's not... Um, that's not in the end going to be very good for the cats if you're um, not in a good place yourself. So you and, and then how many cats are you feeding, right? Are you feeding three cats in your backyard and you can comfortably afford top quality canned food? Then then feed that. On the other hand, if you're feeding uh, 30 cats a night and um, your income is is limited and um, you know, really, you're you're relying on large uh, bags of dry food because they're they're more of a value. Then that's fine too. It's it's there's there's no judgment here. It you you have to take both 
the nutritional value of the food and the importance of your financial stability into account. So that said, on the dry food side, um, there are some really good value brands out there that are relatively low cost. They're not the cheapest, but they're not relatively expensive. They're relatively, you know, good price. And um, you can get them in large bags. And uh, they're, they're, so they're a good value financially, and they provide pretty good nutrition. And here's three that we're aware of. Um, uh, the Kirkland Signature is the Costco store brand. So if you don't have a Costco card, very good reason to get one. So you can get access to these. I think they're 20 or 25 pound bags. They're very reasonably priced. Uh, Rachel Ray Nutrish, um, natural chicken and brown rice is uh, surprisingly um, affordable. And then Diamond Naturals is also a great, a great dry food that is um, more in the, oh, I think it's about $1.50 a pound range when you buy the, the big bags, which is, which is pretty good. Okay, so where do you feed your cats? Um, there's a few, few tips, you know, guidelines that we've kind of developed over the years. One is that um, we believe that low visibility is best. Uh, that discretion is in the cat's interests. Um, so if you can feed the cats in the backyard instead of the front yard, uh, we would advise you to do that. And I would also point out, like if you look at this photo, it's, a, it's kind of, this is the very first colony that I worked on and we're talking, well, I won't say how many years ago, but a very long time ago, these cats are not with us anymore. Um, and what happened was, we, we used to feed in a backyard of one of the businesses on the, on the block. And we were so enthusiastic that we were always there, you know, there in the back, uh, you know, going through, walking through the business. It was a, ironically a pest control company. And um, basically the workers got sick of us after about a year and they kicked us out. Then we had to feed in an empty lot in that same square block. And we had to, uh, we didn't have access. It, it, it was this empty lot and we didn't have access to it. So we had to feed through a fence, through, through one of these old wrought iron fences. And so the food was um, protected from people. They couldn't get into the lot, but everybody could see it. So every year for the next three, four years, um, we'd have one, two, three abandoned cats at that location. Uh, the, the property owner finally, finally came to trust us and gave us a key. And the first thing I did is what you see here was I put the food in the water behind a whole bunch of big rocks so nobody could see it and never had an abandoned cat after that. So um, that's just a word of warning about making your feeding um, more visible than it needs to be. You also want to feed in a way where you're having a minimal impact on neighbors or, or a work site. Um, you want it to be safe and quiet. Remember, it needs to be accessible for you. You, you may find a, just the absolute best spot, but you know if you have to scale a six foot wall and go through a narrow alleyway and all that to get to it, maybe, maybe you should find something a little more convenient. And if you're in an area where there's wildlife, especially if it's considered threatened in any way, you want to avoid that and, and feed as far away from there as possible. Avoid, this, this is a common, common mistake that caretakers often make, which is they put the food right on the ground, like you see here. So the problem with that is um, if they don't eat it all, it stays there and somebody's gonna come along and eat it and it may be a rat or it may be wildlife um, and it's certainly going to it's, uh, cause you problems with neighbors because nobody likes to walk outside and see a big bag of dry food dumped on the driveway or, you know, canned food uh, surround, you know, with, with a swarm of flies around it sitting there rotting on the sidewalk. So um, don't just dump it on the ground. Always put the food on something that you can then pick up and take away. So it could be, you know, paper plates, um, you know, plastic, whatever it might be. 
Now, of course, there's one other aspect to this, which is you got to pick up the plates. You got to take them away. So, you know, we, we deal with feeders right now. And when we come upon the feeding site, what we, we see paper plates and little bowls and they're scattered all over the place, um, which is great for the cats that they didn't have to eat the food off the ground. But it's not, um, uh, you know, it's rather understandable why the local residents are, are starting to get very angry at the cat people because they're making a total mess. So um, use plates and stuff like that. But if you have that feeding pattern and the cats are showing up at uh, 5 p.m., they'll be done eating by 5.30 or circle back later and pick up the garbage. That is the number one complaint against people who feed cats. And believe me, I'm not accusing everybody of doing this. I think most people are conscientious, but you know, have a look at this slide and you can see not everybody is. Um, and that is um, often people uh, who, who are not connected to, you know, are, are tolerant to the cats, not, not particularly cat lovers, they end up not wanting them around, not because of the cats themselves, but because of the people and the people not showing respect for the neighborhood. And, and the number one way people are disrespectful when they are is by leaving all this um, garbage behind them. So um, pick everything up, including the, the non-cat trash. Like um, it, it doesn't help to, you know, an area is clean or it's not clean. And when people come along, they're not going to say, oh, you know, the feeder didn't leave that bag of garbage. Um, they're just going to think the place is a mess. So when we clean up a site, we just pick up everything and be a good neighbor. And actually, um, that will that will help you with neighbors. Don't leave bags of trash on site with any food inside them because uh, you could end up harming uh, wildlife when they when they rip that bag open and try to get to the food. So what about feeding stations? Always recommend them whenever they're possible. Obviously, they're not always possible. But if you can build a little structure that the cats um, where the food is kept in, and water is kept inside of it has a number of advantages. One is that it uh, keeps everything neat and uh, clean. Um, it can also allow the cats to, uh, you know, protect the food and, and the cats eating during um, inclement weather. Um, so, and, and, and you can keep your supplies, uh, like, you know, dishes and things like that. Maybe some, um, we'll talk about middle vaults, but, you know, things you can store food in that can't, can't be accessible to animals. Gives you a place just to keep everything. Now, the key thing to understand about feeding stations is they're not shelters. So you're not trying to keep the cats warm. You're trying to protect the food. So you need to have a large opening for the cats to go in like you see in this uh, plywood feeding station in this slide. And the reason for that is if you have just like one small doorway like you would have in a winter shelter, you know, Mr. Top of the Ladder Tomcat can um, go in there and easily keep everybody out and decide he's, he likes hanging out in there. So in order to prevent that, you either need to have one large opening in the front or at least two smaller doorways um, on either side so cats can go in and out and, and not um, end up being territorial about the whole thing. So as I say, in this slide, you're seeing uh, a pretty simple winter shelter that's made out of plywood. But there's all sorts of um, creative things that you can do. You can, um, as you see on the upper left, you can take a 30 gallon uh, trash can, put it on its side, uh, maybe put a couple of cinder blocks next to it so it doesn't roll away. And boom, you have an instant great um, feeding station. You can also take storage bins. Um, 55 gallon is great. We, we, we often are, like now we in the burn zone, we use uh, 30 gallon ones. So the cats can't get in there, but they can stick their heads in, um, which is good enough um, You know, when you're in a temperate climate. If you're in a kind of more inclement climate, then you probably want these bigger storage bins so they can go all, all the way in. 
But basically, you're taking these storage bins and you're getting a box cutter and you're tracing um, the uh, opening of the door in the front. And you just take your box cutter and just keep tracing it and pushing down lightly. And within, you know, five to 10 minutes, you'll have sliced all the way through and you'll have an instant uh, feeding station, which is easy to keep clean um, because the lid, you know, you got the lid you can take on and off. One tip, put something heavy on the lid um, so it doesn't blow away like a rock or a couple of bricks or something like that. Uh, now, you know, and then on your lower left, you see the, the smaller um, feeding station. So that will have a doorway on both short ends. But it's also very simple and, and inexpensive. If you want to go the fancier route, you can actually go to a website uh, at a company called Feral Via. And they have um, pre prefabricated uh, feeding stations that you just, they ship to you and you screw them together. And they're um, very high quality. And as you can see, uh, nice designs. Even They even have shingle roofs. So you can go that route if you want. There's also, for those of you who really want to um, get sophisticated and hide your feeding stations, um, there are mock, what are called mock rocks. And that's what you, you see um, depicted here. That's, that's, that's a fake boulder. It's hollow inside. It's um, made of some type of, uh, you know, uh, resin, uh, poly resin uh, material, which you can buy one of these and then, um, you know, get a jigsaw and cut uh, a doorway so that they can, and then obviously keep the food and the water inside there. So that's your your gold standard. Now, they're, they're not cheap. Uh, the bigger they are, the costlier they are. Uh, but, you know, it, it might be worth a one-time investment. Or you can go on to YouTube and you can, um, there's, there, there's 103 different videos about how to make a faux rock cover. And, and just do it yourself uh, for, for quite a bit less um, cost. So gravity feeders are another, um, can be another very useful device. And you see one here. Um, and a couple of things about that. Um, it's really, it's like, like, you know, I've been emphasizing, it's better not to leave food out all the time um, you don't have a feeding pattern. You're potentially attracting other animals. <clears throat> but there are situations where um, you can't. Uh, you, you, you can't feed on a regular basis. Maybe there, you have limited access to the facility. So like <clears throat> this particular cat um, lives in a jail, on the grounds of a jail. So, um, yeah, they weren't going to let us just kind of come marching in every day at five o'clock and feeding the cats. So we needed to use a gravity feeder and um, have food available on a regular basis. Now, um, if you um, if you if you don't need to use a gravity feeder, you know, then 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 obviously don't. It's also possible that you may uh, maybe you're going to go away for the for three or four days or, or for a week, God forbid, you actually take a vacation. And um, you can safely leave a gravity feeder somewhere and um, know that your cats will have access to food during the period you're gone. That can be a real legitimate use of them as well. And, and they have automatic waterers uh, too. Now, one, one tip about this is only use the smallest ones that, that you need. So these these automatic waterers and feeders they come in um, you know multiple uh, sizes. I mean from from one gallon to to ten. Don't get a ten gallon automatic waterer <laughs> because then you're going to have to tote ten gallons of water uh, to change it. So if you only need one gallon or two gallons, use that. And the same with the dry food. Um, although that's not as critical an issue because um, the food the food typically doesn't doesn't go bad. It's the water that is um, hard to keep uh, changing. So um, we have found they they um, it can be it's not a bad idea to have more than one. 
so that you can swap them out because they can get um, pretty dirty and they, need, they do need to be cleaned, especially the automatic orderers can start to get algae, if, especially if they're in the sun at all. So rather than spending time on the site, um, scrubbing them and cleaning them, uh, obviously a lot easier if you can just swap it out with a clean feeder or waterer. Um, usually it's the waterers that are the problem and take the dirty one home and clean it. But you know that may be a luxury um, that you can't afford. So a few other tips when it comes to uh, feeding. Um, just some tricks we've kind of learned over the years. If you don't have a feeding station and it's going to rain, um, uh, what do you do if you want to make sure the cats get their foods, at least for that day? So one of the things you can do is what you see in this photo on the left, which is a, a, your typical takeout uh, dish, right? And fill it with uh, dry food and take the lid, turn it upside down and put it on top. So that will effectively keep the rain out of the food. But when the cats come out later after the rain stops, they, uh, they can easily just push the lid off and have access to, to the food. I mentioned Vittel, Vittel's Vault. Um, that's the product you see in the middle. Um, if you want to keep dry food stored on site, this is what you want to use because um, it doesn't give off any, it, it contains the scent of the food as well as the food itself. It's impossible for um, an animal to open that on, on its own. And then the arm extender is real good for if you're feeding through fences or difficult to, to uh, access spots. So when we were feeding through the fence at that original colony, we would take our arm extender and push the food back from the fence so it was out of anybody's uh, arm's reach. Okay, feeding in the winter time. Uh, um, the cats actually need more food in the winter time because uh, they need to move around more in order to stay warm. So there's been some research on this and it shows that on average cats need about 15% uh, more food in the uh, winter time than they do in uh, warmer weather. So, oh, sorry. Uh, so, the problem for those of you who live in uh, colder climates is that you you have to rely more on dry food, right? Because uh, if the cats are right there and you can give them wet food, then 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 go ahead and do that whenever you have that opportunity. But um, if you can't do that, uh, then you have to use dry food because the wet food will freeze. So it's. Uh, Cats always need access to water, but when you're relying on dry food, it's even more important because they're not getting moisture from, from the food. So um, how do you solve that problem? Well, there's a number of ways to um, stop or slow water from freezing. And here's a, here's a few. We've got more on our website at neighborhoodcats.org. Um, if you look under the... Um, how to TNR or colony caretaking section, you'll, you'll see a page on uh, stop freezing water. But these are some of the highlights. There's the, a device called the solar sipper, which uh, absorbs sunlight and then uses that to heat the water and it will stop it from freezing down to about 20 degrees. Um, you can get an electric heated water bowl and never have any water freezing. It will, have, you, you need to get a large, water bowl and fill it all the way because uh, the water will evaporate over time. So it needs to be um, filled every day and filled to the top. There's devices called Snuggle Safe where you can put them in the microwave for uh, a good 10 minutes or so and then um, put them under the water dish and that will be a heat source uh, for at least a few hours. Those are products you can purchase. If you want to go the do-it-yourself route, here's some, some tricks for you. So the deeper and wider the bowl is, the water bowl is, the longer it will take for the water to freeze. So there's an example of just one. So you can see it's a thick plastic, so it's good insulation, it's deep, it's wide. 
you can also take your water bowl and put it inside a styrofoam cooler, like one of those little picnic coolers that you can buy for you know several dollars uh, in the summertime. Just make sure you get it in the summertime because it won't be available in the winter. And you just take a steak knife and cut a doorway in one of the short sides and stick your water bowl inside there. And that, um, again, it will slow the freezing process because the styrofoam will insulate, um, keep it um, the temperature warmer longer. Same thing that you see on the on the right of the slide. Those are little vaccine boxes. Um, so they're pretty small. And what you can do is line the interior with a plastic, with a, you know, a thick, uh, you know, it could be a, a, a garbage bag, a, a, a trash bag, you know, a small container like your um, kitchen waste basket, something like that. And put that in there, cut a round hole just a few inches uh, wide, maybe maybe three inches, two to three inches wide on the, through the top of the box and then um, big enough so that the cats can kind of stick their face in and their tongue down and reach the water. And that too will insulate the water and um, dramatically slow down uh, the, the time it takes for the water to freeze. Um, if you're dealing with a lot of snow and you need to clear a path for the cats, um, you want to, you know, well, you can use a shovel um, like Jade uh, was doing in this uh, in this slide. Uh, sometimes uh, you, people want to just, you know, use um, some type of solution to, to just kind of melt the path. Uh, but you don't want to use rock salt or any type of chemical de-icers because they can be um, toxic and highly irritating to a cat's paws and things like that. So if you want a safe solution, use use what's on the uh, formula that's written on the slide here, which is a Dawn dish detergent mixed with uh, rubbing alcohol and warm water. And that will melt the snow away and, and the ice away and not, not be harmful to the cats. What about insects? Um, what about ants in the food? That's a that's a common complaint. So the the trick is that ants can't swim. So you put your you create a moat that the ants can't cross in order to get to the food bowl. So here's one example of, of a building a moat, which is getting a, a cookie pan, a cookie sheet pan, and um, just putting a bit of water on the bottom and then taking your food bowl and putting it right in the middle. So very easy for the cats to get to the food, but impossible for the ants to get there. Now, if you need a smaller setup, you can do this, which is uh, what we call a pan and a pan moat. So you take two pans that are the exact same size. One of them on the left, your, your filling with uh, you know an inch of water at the bottom. And then you take a couple of little small plastic bowls and fill them with water too. So that, uh, and, and that the, the bowl should be more centered than the one is on the, um, the bottom left there. You don't want them touching the walls of the pan because that would give the cats, a, I mean the ants a pathway that didn't involve going through the water. So you then take your, the other pan, fill it with uh, food, and put it in the pan with the little bowls in it. So it's raised up off of, um, it's not touching the other pan, it's, it's raised up by those little bowls, and there's no way for the ants to, um, to get to the dry food. So the advantage to, um, I know I'm getting awfully esoteric here, but this is what we deal with every day now <laughs> up in Lahaina. Um, the the disadvantage, I'm sorry, the disadvantage to this, what we've learned is that as the cats eat, they may drop bits of food in the water. And 24 hours later, that smells really bad. Um, so if you do it this way, uh, food does not get into the moat water and it just stays a lot cleaner. So what about flies? Um, well, you have to work around them. And um, so you don't want to leave wet food sitting out on a hot summer day because then you're going to get swarmed with flies. So if you're feeding wet food and it's not being eaten right away, 
only put it out um, maybe at dusk or early in the morning when it's cooler. They flies are less; they're not unattracted to dry food, but they're a lot less attracted. Probably the best way to deal with flies is they sleep at night. So if your cats are eating at sundown, um, at least during the summertime, you'll avoid you'll avoid issues with flies. And for those of you um, for the for the cat caretakers who have everything, um, you might want to get them this as a Christmas present. And that's um, a potent. It's a it's a wireless auto feeder. So it's this one particular brand, um, which you can get at that link. It has a couple of nice things. It, it's raised off the ground, so that that's very nice. Um, but you know, kind of the the techie part of it is you can program it with your smartphone uh, when to dispense meals. So you can fill the thing up, and you can uh, you know set the meals to come out. I think up to ten, well maybe maybe at least ten meals uh, that will automatically be dispensed. So um, if you're feeling lazy one day and you don't want to uh, make the walk over to the colony site, you can just pick up your phone and tell tell it to feed the cats now. Um, what about slugs? Um, they they can be a problem too. There's, there's a, um, a few ways to work around that. Um, my favorite one is just leave a little dry food on the side. You know, the slugs, if, if the food is right there on the ground, um, and we're talking just a, a few pieces of, of dry food potentially. Uh, the slugs will just go to that. They, you know, they're actually not stupid. And if they can eat food that's right there on the ground, they're going to do that rather than kind of slime their way up the bowl and into the food. So just put a little bit, tiny bit on the side for them. If that's not working for you, then you um, can use what's called diatomaceous earth uh, and create. Um, like a circle around the food bowl with it. So diatomaceous earth is actually these microscopic shellfish that it's, and it's not the shellfish, it's their um, shells. And it feels like a fine powder, like a baby powder or something like that. But it, it, on a microscopic level, it's actually, they're quite jagged and sharp. So slugs or other insects will not walk across it because it will injure them. So if you create a little circle around your feeding area with diatomaceous earth, it won't hurt the cats at all, but it will keep the insects away. You can do the same thing with um, crushed eggshells or chalk powder, same idea that to, to your hand, it may feel smooth, but to a slugs, it's going to feel very sharp. Uh, sheet of sandpaper, if you put the food bowl on a big sheet of sandpaper, same thing. The, the slugs um, and, and creatures like that will not want to um, to go over it. Now, when you're using diatomaceous earth, and we'll speak about it again later when it comes to fleas and things like that, it's super important to understand there are two kinds of it. There's what's called food grade, and there's pool grade, P-O-O-L. The food grade is what you want. That is not harmful. Um, if a cat ingests it, it will not hurt them. In fact, some farmers use diatomaceous earth food grade and they feed it to their uh, cows and um, in order to kill the parasites inside the cow's um, you know, uh, digestive system. So it's extremely mild. However, keep in mind that it's, it's actually just millions of tiny little sharp objects. So you do not want to inhale it. If you inhale a lot of diatomaceous earth, you could seriously damage your lungs. So um, wear a dusk mask if you're spreading it around and it's getting in the air, or very carefully spread it so that it's not um, dissipating uh, you know, uh, in an aerosol kind of way. OK, so moving along now with our uh, colony caretaker, we're caretaking, we're going to move into a new subject area, and that's uh, winter shelter, which is kind of timely, right, for, for this uh, time of year. And, uh, you know, it's important to understand cats are very good at finding places to shelter and to stay dry, but they do need help also staying warm, um, especially in very cold climates like the Northeast or, uh, you know, the Midwest, things like, or Canada. Um, so 
we uh, you know we want to provide that for them and make sure that they they have a warm safe place to to sleep now there are three it, winter shelters you see they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and materials and forms but they the good ones all share, share three qualities one is obviously that they're waterproof uh, but also they're well insulated and that means the material that the shelter is made of is capable of trapping and retaining heat so think uh, styrofoam is is really one of the most uh, popular uh, kinds of shelter um, materials that is so for example um, if you get a, a dog house and it's made of a thin plastic you know that will keep them dry but it's not going to keep them warm and you also want to have minimal airspace uh, that's not filled in by the cats being in the shelter because what's happening in a winter shelter is the cats go in and they emit body heat and the shelter if it's a good winter shelter is going to trap that body heat and warm up the space so if the material that the shelter is made of is not good insulation then that body heat is going to pass through the walls or if there's too much empty space again think of the large dog shelter uh, and you put a cat or two in there there's there's still going to be a lot of empty space and too much for the cat's bodies to heat up so you need to match the size of the shelter with the number of cats who are using it so a shelter that might be great for four cats might not work really well if there's just one the shelter you're seeing in this slide is one that you can easily make a similar type at home it's a it's a large styrofoam box i think it was used for for transporting fish and um it's wrapped in a in a kind of heavy industrial plastic but you can get this kind of plastic at um just get contract what are called contractor bags at a uh, home depot or lowe's and they're just very heavy duty uh, bags that contractors and construction people use to throw put their trash in so it's not like your the trash bags you're going to get at the supermarket which are pretty thin and rip easily a uh, contractor bag plastic is much thicker than that now on in this slide that uh, plastic is attached to the shelter with um, plastic uh, bands that are kind of meld, uh, welded on so you don't need to get that fancy you can just get some duct tape and um, wrap it around uh, a few bands of duct tape around the shelter will will hold the plastic in place here's another kind um, that you can do it's uh, we call it the neighborhood cats winter shelter and you can get the plans um, detailed plans by clicking on this link and what it is and you can see somebody obviously making one it's a it's a two foot by eight foot two inch thick piece of hard styrofoam okay and that uh, I'll say that again it's eight foot by two foot two inches thick hard styrofoam and it's mostly used for insulating attics or walls or things like that for home insulation if you use our plans you you will take that uh, piece of uh, that sheet of styrofoam cut it up into a number of pieces and use every square inch uh, to to make the shelter by gluing all the pieces back together the only downside to building this shelter is you have to have a table saw or be very good at cutting in straight lines because if you if you just do a saw by hand or something like that um, you're liable not to get nice um, smooth edges and it could be you, you'll have a lot of cracks when you glue the um, pieces together like you're seeing here um, but it can be done just take a lot more silicone to fill in all the uh, cracks and things like that this can comfortably hold the space you're seeing there just to give you an idea of what um, how much room you need inside your shelters that shelter can very comfortably hold three cats and uh, even four. And in fact, there was one very cold morning uh, 
where I showed up at the colony site early and I saw um, I saw five cats come out of one of these. So, so that's what they do is they, they get in there and they press up real close to each other and they all become kind of heating sources for the for the whole space and they stay um, remark it, it can be remarkably warm inside one of these if there's enough cats in there. Is another one um, that's that's even easier to make. You you get your storage bin, um, cut a doorway in it like you see there with a box cutter, and you can get even one inch thick styrofoam sheets and um, press them against the floor of the a storage bin and the sides. And you can see they don't have to be uh, form fitting. Just just loosely. Uh, they don't have to be pressed up against exactly against each other so you don't have to cut them exactly and then you have a piece of styrofoam that goes on the top and then you put the lid of the bin on and boom you've got your shelter <coughs> so um pretty pretty easy to make and, and very effective again styrofoam boxes you hear the word styrofoam coming up a lot because it's lightweight it's great insulation you can just take a styrofoam box and it, like um that that food is shipped in like this one and just cut a door in it and um, put the top on and glue it on if you want to if it's if it's form fitting then don't glue it on because you'll be able to it'll be easier to keep the shelter clean if you can take the top off and then just um, coat the thing with the deck paint and uh, you've you've got that's that's a winter shelter that's good for uh, at least one cat probably uh, two and we have Ferrovia if you uh, just want to buy one and um, screw it together. And this is, again, very, very well made. If you're in an emergency, like a storm is coming and you don't have, for whatever reason, you don't have adequate winter shelter out, you can um, get by at least for uh, whatever storm is coming with just uh, cardboard boxes. And the way you, you can get, um, I'll go over it, but you can read the plans again. They're on our website. We have a, a, a feral cat winter shelter page that describes um, how to do this in, in detail. But basically, you're taking a cardboard box and then you're taking a, a smaller cardboard box and putting it inside. And then the space in between you're stuffing with a uh, newspaper. So the newspaper is actually great insulation. So below the smaller, so you've got a box in a box and the box that's inside is being surrounded with folded newspaper or stuffed newspaper or whatever it is. Then you're taking uh, a plastic drop cloth, again, three millimeters thick is your best bet. And you're wrapping it around the outer box and using duct tape to keep it in place. And then of course, um, cutting open a doorway. And that's that's a great temporary winter shelter. One other thing to notice, well, a few things to notice from this slide is how there's um, one shelter facing another shelter and there's a piece of wood in between them that, and you can see there's actually a black cat right in the middle there um, between the two shelters you're creating a little, um, well, first of all, by having the doorways facing each other, you're blocking the wind. Having that little um, bridge between the two shelters gives a little uh, space where you can put food and things like and water where the cats don't have to travel very far uh, and it'll be protected from the weather. Also notice how the shelters are raised off the ground just a little bit. And then finally, there are heavy objects placed on top of the shelters uh, to keep them in place because they're very lightweight. So you don't want them blowing away. And look, look how big the, um, you've got this big planter sitting on top of these cardboard boxes, but that's how strong uh, the shelters are uh, structurally that they, they can withstand that kind of weight being put down on them. Uh, placement. So I use this slide a little reluctantly because um, they didn't paint the shelters, right? <laughs> so they kind of stick out like a sore thumb on the landscape. Um, so maybe this is a good example of what not to do. Um, you know, take a moment and paint them so they, they, they camouflage in. 
but maybe they didn't have to worry about that because it was their own backyard. You, you can see a couple of things here. Um, notice again how you have the wood um, spanning the space, the shelters or doorways are facing each other. And there's a, a piece of wood on top of both that is creating this um, protected area between them. Now, uh, ideally, put the uh, you, you can feed in that that uh, kind of hallway in between the a corridor between the um, two rows of shelters. If you're not doing that, then make sure your winter shelters are not that far from where the cats eat so that they don't have to travel a far distance in order to get there. And again, discreet is always better. So um, it, it, it's preferable not to have bright pink uh, winter shelters. Of course, if they're covered with snow <laughs> like, like these are, maybe that's not as, um, not as important. So what about inside the winter shelters? What, what do you put there? And they're what we call insulating materials. And the concept to understand about putting materials inside of a winter shelter is the way that they can make a cat warmer is if the cat can burrow into it. It doesn't make them warmer to lie on top of something. Like if you put a blanket on the floor that's that's nice from uh, it's soft and they may appreciate that. But if that's all you have in there, it's actually going to make them colder, not warmer, because when they lie on top of it, the blanket will draw body heat out of the cat. Uh, it only provides warmth if the cat's under the blanket. So we don't want to do things like put towels and blankets and things like that and just lay them on the floor of the shelter. What you want is something like straw, which you can stuff in there, and then the cat can get in and just burrow his way. And, and as he's uh, sleeping, he's basically enveloped by the straw. That will make him extra warm. A lot of people confuse straw with hay. Um, they're not the same thing. Straw is dry, and hay is moist. Hay is a food um, for certain animals. You know, the straw is nothing, is not food. So because hay is like a food, it's moist and it can um, develop mold, which the cats can ingest uh, through their noses and cause all kinds of health issues. So do not confuse hay with straw. Now, if you can't get a hold of straw, and you can usually get straw at uh, Home Depot sells uh, bundle straw, sometimes, um, arts and crafts stores, especially around this time of year when there's all sorts of Christmas displays, you can you can buy little bundles of um, straw. So it's really not too hard to, stables, not too hard to find. But if you are having trouble, you can use shredded newspaper. It will work uh, just the same way. The, the cats are able to uh, burrow into it. Now there is a, a product uh, if you want to provide the cats with something soft to lie on that will keep them warm, it's this uh, product called the Purr Pad. And there's a link to it at uh, that you, where you can buy that pet goat. And this, this is a material that's actually designed to not only uh, draw body heat out from the cat, but then retain it and radiate it back. So it is like they're lying on a little, um, you know, warm blanket that's, that's emitting heat. So that's a that's the one exception to the don't give them something that they just lie on. The per pad is great. If you're in a super cold climate, you can use what's called mylar blankets, which are those aluminum looking uh, folded sheets at, in the middle of your screen. If you're in a cold climate, you should always have one of these in your car, because if your car breaks down in very cold temperatures um, and you're stuck for hours, you're going to want one of these to wrap around yourself because uh, they're super thin, um, but they, they were developed by NASA originally, this material, Mylar, and it's super thin and you wrap it around you and it it traps all the body heat and you can be quite warm in, in very cold temperatures. So what you can do with a cat winter shelter is line the walls and the ceiling and even the floor 
with mylar blankets, just make sure it's glued really well in place. And then all the body heat that the cat emits is, is not only retained by the shelter, but the mylar blanket then reflects it back at them. Um, and this is a popular thing that uh, a lot of colony caretakers, and for example, in Canada use uh, because of the extra cold that they uh, experience up there. All right, um, moving on to another subject, and that's um, dealing with neighbors who don't want the cats around. So the easiest way to do that is just to help them keep the cats out. If it's a normal kind of backyard or um, garden, um, rather than argue with them about, you know, that the cats have a right to be there, and, you know, that doesn't usually end up helping the cats at all if you get into a confrontation. On the other hand, if you help them keep the cats out, um, then then you you know you've got a better working relationship. So there are two <laughs> two devices that are most popular in accomplishing this, and they both work off of the same kind of um, theory, which is they're um, motion activated. They they emit these infrared fields, and when a cat steps into them, it sets the device off. So in the case of the ultrasonic uh, device, it emits a sound that's highly irritating to cats. Now it doesn't penetrate solid objects, so it won't bother your pet cats inside. It won't bother the cats on the other side of the fence. If you get this particular kind, the yard guard one, it won't it won't bother the birds either. Uh, and after after so most of the cats will just leave. Sometimes you get some that are stubborn and they'll try to stick it out but after a week or so of listening to this you know irritating noise they they tend to go away the motion activated sprinkler on the other hand shoots out a burst of water when a cat steps steps into the infrared field it doesn't get them wet but it shoots it out in this kind of rapid fire violent way that frightens them and what happens with both these devices is the cats learn the boundaries of the infrared field, and they don't step into that territory. After a while, you don't even need to leave them up. You might need to once in a while to put it back on just to remind them, but they learn pretty quickly. Don't walk over there if you don't want water being sprayed at you. Uh, obviously, um, with the water, you would want to train the cats uh, and, and set that up before the uh, you're, you're in freezing uh, temperatures. Otherwise, it won't work because it has to be hooked up to a hose. Now, with the ultrasonic devices, uh, it's all about placement and, and putting using um, the right size device for the amount of area you're trying to cover and then placing them properly. And that's where people get tripped up because you can't see it working, right? Like with the sprinkler, we like them because you can see it in action. It's, with the uh, ultrasonic device, you can't hear it. So you don't really know if it's working or not necessarily. That's why we have one of our handouts is how to use an ultrasonic deterrent. And it's just a three pager with um, lots of diagrams. And um, if, you, if you follow those instructions, this device should work for you. And here's, uh, here's some examples of um, how you need to place it, uh, an ultrasonic device. Uh, properly. So uh, obviously, if this device has a 25 foot range, you don't want to um, try to cover an area that's uh, 30, 40 feet away. Um, you have to, real the device um, and its infrared pick up motion that's at um, with, within a, a certain height off the ground. So if you place these too high off the ground, the cats will go under them, under the infrared field. So they shouldn't be more than about six to eight inches off the ground. Um, another common mistake that's made. I want to point them in commonly you know, frequented areas where the cats are going, make sure the batteries are functioning, and give it a little time to work. Um, like I said, most cats will just go away right away. There'll, there'll be a couple who try to stick it out, and you just have to be a little patient, and eventually they'll they'll um, leave the area as well. Physical barriers are another way to deter cats from um, potentially harming property or staying out of gardens. Um, uh, car covers are, are, are quite effective. Uh, you can get um, cat-proof fencing that's considerably more expensive, but 
if you want to go that route, um, you know, it's this fencing is designed mostly to keep cats within areas, but you can also turn the tops of them around and keep cats out of areas as well. But it is a pricey product, although um, quite effective. There are cat scat mats, which are great for gardens and keeping cats out. They, they the little um, uh, rubber spikes, not sharp enough to, to harm cats, but certainly, uh, you know, annoying enough to keep them out of the garden and stop them from digging. And you just press these into the ground. Uh, you can use lattice fencing, also um, prevents digging and put your seeds in the openings of the lattice. And then river rocks, um, uh, any type of rock of that sort will serve the same purpose here. These, these are for gardens and basically you're preventing the cats from being able to dig, which will stop them from using the garden as a litter box. Here's a combination of a couple of things that we came up with that worked quite well. Um, not the most sightly of things, but <laughs> very effective at keeping the cats away. So, you know, the car cover protects the, the um, car, but what we found was um, the cats were, uh, especially in the sunlight and the constant uh, strong sun here in Hawaii, the car covers were getting brittle and then the cats were um, able to get under them and they were ripping and this and that. So we, we combined a car cover with a, a couple of uh, longer uh, cat scat, rolls of cat scat mats. And as you can see, just bungee corded the mats onto the top of the car and that made it so the cats did not want to be on this vehicle and they and they stayed away and left it alone. Um, all, an alternative, giving the cats another place to eliminate it within the territory is also can be an effective strategy for, uh, you know, managing their presence and, and not having um, the garden or parts of the yard used as a um, their litter box, you just give them a big one that um, is more attractive. So one idea is this uh, sandbox, and you, and you can just get uh, sandbox sand, which is very inexpensive, and just, you know, every however long you need to, however, you know, period of time, it could be two weeks, it could be a month, you know, dump the sand and put a bunch of fresh uh, in or scoop it on a regular basis, whatever it might be, to keep it clean. Another idea is they like to eliminate in peat moss. Um, so that should say pile of peat moss, not pile of peat box, sorry, um, M-O-S-S. -S. And um, that's a very inexpensive product you can get at gardening stores and you put a pile of it in the corner of the yard and that's where they'll, where they'll go. And again, you can use one of our favorite um, objects, which is a storage bin, put litter in the bottom, cut a doorway, and have them uh, go there. So basic ideas, give them somewhere more attractive to go than where you, uh, your garden or where, wherever you don't want them. Okay, our last topic we're gonna go over today before we get to um, uh, do some Q&A are uh, health hacks. And um, so we're not, not trying to dispense uh, veterinary advice here. I wanna be careful about that. If your cat is sick, or injured, or um, for whatever reason you're concerned ab about their well-being, obviously you want to try to get them to a veterinarian. Um, these are more along the lines of um, how do you keep cats healthy so you don't reach a point where they need uh, veterinary intervention. So um, it doesn't have to be, you know, costly or difficult. And and um, you know, if you do some of these simple preventative things. You might save yourself some um, some big vet bills and some difficult trapping. So vitamin C is a great supplement for cats. Um, now they naturally produce a certain amount of vitamin C themselves within their own systems, but in times of stress, that vitamin C is rapidly depleted. So you want to supplement it. Uh, so it could be um, harder weather. It could be before uh, a trapping, um, where food is with, where, where the routine is disrupted. Anything that might cause them extra stress is going to cause them to use vitamin C up faster, and it's a good time to supplement it. It's also not a bad idea to just on a regular. It doesn't have to be daily, but um, even if in non-stressful times, 
to um, on a regular basis provide them with some extra C. If if they uh, you can't overdose on vitamin C, it will just the excess will just pass through their system. So how do you get them um, vitamin C? Well, probably the way that they would enjoy the most is um, organic tomato sauce uh, because they you know a lot of cats love tomato sauce and it just happens to be very high in vitamin C. What you want to do though is make sure there's no onion. Um, in the tomato sauce because the onion can cause them a lot of damage. Um, they're not able to, that can harm their kidneys. So get a tomato sauce that does not have onions or other, um, it, where it's just pure tomato sauce. You can also use powdered supplements, you know, powdered vitamin C supplements. It will have a little bit of a bitter taste. So you have to mix it in um, with something that's very tasty. And then you can give up to um, 250 milligrams, which is about an eighth of a teaspoon um, for each cat with each meal. That would be about the proper proper dosage. d monos is um, a supplement that's just not that widely known, but it's a great it's a great product uh, for male cats who may be ex um, at risk of urinary issues, you know, blockages or bacterial infections. Um, so when we see our male pet cats, um, if they start to look like they're straining and developing any type of urinary um, issue, obviously if they're not passing urine, that you need to take them immediately to a veterinarian because they could be blocked. But short of blockage, if it's just starting out, we'll give them this product. It's a cranberry extract and um, it often clears it up in our experience rapidly. So um, you can, uh, it, it basically eliminates that harmful bacteria. That, that's why, you know, sometimes when people have urinary tract infections, they drink a lot of cranberry juice. It's the same idea, only this is much, much more concentrated and you, people can use this too. Uh, I, you'll have to consult with a, a dietitian about what the dosage should be. But with cats, you're looking at um, about an eighth of a teaspoon twice a day per cat. Um, and it can be especially helpful for cats who are, you know, prone to these uh, types of diseases to to stop them from developing into major infections. You can also give cats probiotics, which um, promote healthy intestinal flora. That's the the good bacteria. Um, you know, our our bodies um, have good bacteria, and sometimes um, if we're sick, they have bad bacteria. The problem with something like antibiotics is it. They, they often kill both. So especially if your cats are being treated with antibiotics, it's a very good idea to try to get some probiotics into them to replenish that, that good bacteria that's in there. And again, you can add it to the food or water. Um, check, check the particular brand for dosage, but generally it's about a quarter of a teaspoon uh, per day daily. And there's a million um, different uh, brands and varieties out there that you can you can use. So what about fleas? Um, controlling them in a natural way, uh, you can um, again go back to our good friend Diotomaceous Earth. Although you're making sure that you're wearing a dust mask if you're uh, if it may get into the air, you can spread it into cracks and crevices uh, inside the shelter, any areas where fleas may uh, gather and it will kill them on the contact. You can even rub it onto the cat um, through their fur and that will kill the fleas too. And again, if the cats lick their fur and they ingest, if, as long as it's food grade, not the pool, it will not be at all harmful uh, to them. Another way to control fleas naturally is what's called beneficial nematodes. And they, these are these um, microscopic, uh, well, they're, they're similar to worms. And basically, uh, when you put them on a, a lawn, they just march, make their way through the lawn, eating all the flea larvae that they can find. Um, and they can clear up an area pretty, pretty quickly. The trick is to apply them properly, which is to spray over grass in uh, shady areas during a cool part of the day. If you if you spray them 
in, the, in a sunny area in the middle of a hot day, uh, they'd probably just die right away. Now, if you're looking for um, over-the-counter, you know, more on the medication side for flea control, again, we're talking community cats, so we're assuming that you know, you can't uh, necessarily give them a dose of advantage between their shoulder blades. So you need some way to administer the medication without having to um, touch uh, the cat. Uh, there's a product called Capstar, and it uh, basically you put it in their food, and after um, within 15, 15 minutes of ingesting it, all the fleas are, are dead. It doesn't provide longer lasting protection. It's not gonna, it's not like Advantage where it will last for 30 days and kill all the flea eggs and kill any fleas that come on in the next month. It's just one and done. But it's a great way to kind of clear the cats. And if you do it periodically, um, it can be quite effective at, at, you know, not letting infestations happen. It's safe for kittens over two pounds. Um, it's active ingredient as you can see under the name Capstar, sort of the best known brand, but the ingredient is Knight and Pyrum. So there's a lot of uh, generic uh, copies of this that are exactly the same um, you know, substance and they're, they can often be a, quite a bit cheaper. So if you're searching on Amazon, you know, check out Capstar, but then also do a search for Knight and Pyrum, and you may find uh, that you'll save some money that way. Now, how about worms? Well, um, haven't found, you know, if you're, if you're holistically inclined, you can try that um, homeopathic remedy that is listed there on the right that you can get from Chewy. Uh, haven't, you know, really, I, I, I the, you know, the jury's out on how effective that is. I don't have enough, um, haven't talked to enough people with experience of it to, to say one way or the other. So if you want to go more the standard allopathic route, you can get um, some some really effective medication over the counter. There's a uh, Drontal, which is, um, again, for one type of worm. And then there's, um, this tapeworm dewormer that you can get from pet meds also. Um, I think Drontal covers more than just uh, tapeworms. Anyway, you'll have to research uh, a little bit before you buy the products uh, to, to determine which one. Um, but I know uh, when Drontal used to be something you could only get through a veterinarian, um, but it's, it's, it's quite effective at whichever type of worm um, it's, it's aiming at. So um, one question, we've had some questions about, um, well, this is my question and many people might have asked these questions too with the car covers and stuff. You know, we see so many, or at least I think I see on social media all the time about like this kitty is stuck in the wheel well here. This kitty is stuck in the engine here. You've got a bang on the roof of your car engine. Is that really as much of a risk as we're seeing out and about on social media? You know, it's a it's it's a it's a risk if there isn't um, a warm place for the cats to sleep, because then they'll go and find one. And if you're near, if you're they're near a parking lot or something like that, they may well, um, you know, seek the heat of an engine, you know, that that was just turned off or something like that. Um, so those kinds of incidents do happen, and. Um, it is smart in a cold climate in a parking lot if you know there are cats around to to bang on the hood once or twice before okay. you start the engine. Um, that said, it's it's rare, but it it does it does happen. Yeah. So it's a it's an okay practice or a practice that oh, makes yeah. sense to go and bang bang on the car. And even if you are doing that car cover thing, um, the cat still can get up underneath. So that's still something to think about. Or um, yeah, they usually don't, you know, if you bungee cord the car cover on, um, so it's not just flapping around loose, then they, they might try to get under it, but probably not. That, that, yeah, up, you know, up under, under the under, bottom of the car into the oh, engine the underneath from the bottom. Mm. Yeah, but if, if, yes, that is possible. So if you're taking a car cover on and off every day, um, 
and you're in it that kind of cold uh, weather, it, yeah, it's just a real good idea to get into a routine of just bang the hood a couple of times and, yes. and give them a second. That'll scare them and they'll run off. We've gotten a couple of questions from folks who are um, feeding uh, community cats and they feel that they may be faced with moving down the road. Um, how concerned should they be about trying to make plans for the future if they don't know that someone else is feeding that colony? Well, it's always, you know, it. If, if there's two parts to that question. One is like, should I get involved if I don't know where I'm gonna be in a few years? Well, if you don't get involved in a few years, you probably have quite a few more cats to worry about. <laughs> so, you know, addressing that immediate problem is, you know, is, is the number one priority you know, stop the cats from reproducing. Now, in terms of um, how do you deal with uh, if you might move or just, you know, being the only one, that can be really tough to be, you know, seven days a week, you're the one responsible for those cats. So succession and having other people to work with makes it a lot, lot easier. So, you know, you want to uh, seek out neighbors and 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 residents and 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 friends. They don't necessarily have to live right there, but if they can come by, um, I know in New York we have you know a, a network of caretakers all over the city. And when somebody's going to be gone for a few days, they we shoot you know they post or they put up an email and ask if somebody can feed that colony um, while they're gone, and we can usually find someone. So, you know researching social media and especially Facebook groups that are based in your area can be a great way to connect with like-minded people and to find that assistance. It doesn't have to be the person who lives right next door to you. In terms of if you're going to move and you're just not going to be there to care for them anymore, often these it, it's a common misperception that we're the only ones feeding these cats. Um, Often these cats have multiple feeders, and when we do TNR projects, sometimes we find out that you know one cat's got four feeders, and they all have different names uh, for the cat. So that's not always the case, but in a neighborhood, there's often a number of people who are looking out for the cat. So it becomes a matter of um, talking to neighbors, uh, passing out flyers, calling a local meeting about what are we. What do we do with the cats? Uh, do a next door meeting. You know, it it part of TNR, and we talk about this in the workshop, is what we call community relations. It's it's when you're dealing with community cats, you're not just dealing with cats, you're dealing with people. And if you ignore that part of it, it's it's gonna make it harder for you and it's potentially, you know, not as stable a situation for the cats. So get to know your neighborhood, get to know other people. Um, no guarantee that you're going to find someone or it's going to work, but you have much more of a chance of that if you're if you're being proactive and seeking out assistance. I will say, um, if you own your property, it is a seller's market. And there was a story in the Wall Street Journal about people who put their houses on their market and contingent upon the sale of the house, they had to take care of the community cats in their backyard. And so if you do own your own property don't be shy ask for support for those cats to go along with the house yeah yeah i mean especially in a seller's market you can you can find yourself a cat lover <laughs> you know and you give a little bit of a break um maybe help pay for some food over time and um yeah yeah that, that's a great way to find a substitute <laughs> <laughs> it was pro profiled as one of the, you know, the more unique packages that they're getting, but they're yeah. getting it, getting it more, re you know, frequently is yeah. that, you know, they that's don't want to, people don't want to relocate the cats. They're part of the house. They're part of the community. And that's just part of the role that you play as you move in and join the community and the community support there. Uh, question on feeding stations and shelters. How close or how far away should they be? be located to one, an, one another. Um, some people have opinions that they should be farther away. Other people think they should be close together. Your thoughts? Well, I would say a lot of it is weather driven. So if you're in a, um, 
a very cl a cold climate and, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of snow or things like that, then you don't want to make the cats travel a long distance to get to their food. The closer to the shelter, the better. Um, outside of those kind of wintry conditions, it really depends on the layout. There's, there's nothing inherently better about the food being further away or closer other than maybe they get a little more exercise walking across the yard. Um, so a lot of that will just depend on the layout of the place and what makes the most sense. Um, I guess you can make an argument if there's wildlife around that feeding further away from the shelters may keep the wildlife, make it less likely that they'll go into the shelters. So that might be a consideration too. I really think it's a kind of site-by-site -site decision. I, I don't think there's a blanket rule other than in really bad weather, you don't want to make them travel far. Right. And in terms of, you know, preparing for the bad weather, I, I, you know, going way back into my Newburyport days where we were right on the waterfront and it was windy, wet and cold. Um, we always worked really hard in the wintertime to ensure that our shelters were facing away from the wind very much, you know, the back and oh, and we had our openings actually probably against the wind, the buildings, you know, so there was a little bit of an opening for the cats to get into the shelters that way. And, and we had our fuller feral feeding stations, which were those two level feeding stations. The feeding was on the top and then there was a little bit of a shelter there and we had extra shelters around. So there was a lot of variety and selection for different shelters, depending on how the cats, you know, could choose what they wanted to do. But we were always worried about the wind. I know we had lots of wind conversations. So if you are in an area that is very blustery, um, it's really important to pay attention to that issue and redirect your shelters, um, you know, for, for and preparing for storms. If you're preparing for something, some storm to be coming, um, you know, making sure that that you're thinking about that, thinking about what you're going to have to shovel, you know, all the shoveling and the right. and prep, making sure you have a path identified that you're not shoveling up and over different things, trying to have a straight path in there so that you can shovel and get get to the um, the cat's homes. Um, to be able to support them, you know, after a storm. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that also goes towards, you know, having shelters raised up off the ground so that they don't flood, having heavy objects on top so they don't blow away, having two shelters doorways facing each other so that breaks mm -hmm. the wind. Um, yeah, but uh, yes, they have to fit the better you can make them fit into their environment, um, the better. Now, it, it, with when you mention wind, sometimes um, you know the the topic comes up about flaps. You know, do do you put a flap over the shelter door? And I think uh, it's important to understand that's totally optional. It they're great if you can make them work, but um, they do take a little bit of work because you wouldn't want to put a shelter out with a flap on it that and the, and the cats aren't used to going into it yet because that may stop them from ever going in. So first you want them to get used to going in and out of the shelter and then you might duct tape or use like um, plastic nuts and bolts to attach like maybe um, a, a piece of plastic that they can easily pull back to get in and out. But you don't want to try and, and that'll help break the wind and trap more heat. Although again, it's not essential. Um, but don't don't do that until after they're used to going in and out. And when they first, when you first put them out, maybe sprinkle a little catnip inside to, you know, attract them to using it. In Newburyport, we um, would uh, have like almost like a hard carpeting on the on the bottom, and they could slide in between it. But we didn't do that at every shelter. Again, it was variety was the spice of life. We just offered a variety to see what the cats would use. Um, so, so, so we have that. Uh, la um, let me see. Last question. Okay, funding or how to find food uh, to support your colonies and funding for spay neuter. Any ideas? Well, you know, when, when you get into the more um, costly parts of this, that's where having a group, like having a, a local nonprofit profit or something like that, can come in very handy. <coughs> So, for example, you could put up an Amazon as a nonprofit. You could put up an Amazon wish list and do a food drive and just get it out there. People love to donate in kind because um, then they know exactly what their money is buying and people love to buy food. 
Uh, same thing with, with funding. It's a lot easier to raise money as a nonprofit. But if you are working as an individual, um, one tip for you is check out your local pet store. Um, they often have expired food that they can't return to the manufacturer. And, if, and it's um, expired food is usually perfectly good. And the way you know it's not good is it will smell horribly if it's gone bad. So they can sometimes be good a year, at least a year after their expiration date. And, and again, it's not gonna be a guess. If you open that bag or you open that can and it smells horrible, then obviously don't use it. Otherwise, it's fine. And they'll, they'll often donate it um, rather than just, just have it thrown away. So that's one way to do it. Um, you know, fundraising uh, without uh, a nonprofit is a much more limited, but you can um, just let people in your neighborhood know what you're doing. And you don't, I don't think you can solicit funds, unfortunately, but you can have that conversation and often people will offer uh, to assist you with it. But by far the best thing to do is, is start a nonprofit if you wanna get serious about fundraising. And it's not that hard to do. Don't hire a lawyer for thousands of dollars. Go to legalfilings.com or one of these online incorporation websites and they'll do 90% of the work for you for like 10% of the cost of hiring a lawyer. Great, last question. Um, and if folks are interested in uh, other funding resources, they can certainly email me. I'm pretty good at brainstorming on that one. So you can email me at stacy at communitycastpodcast.com, but I know we are at four o'clock, but here's a good one just to close us out. Is there a good rule of thumb for the amount of dry food per community cat per day? Yes, yeah. If you're talking about your average size cat, and we've got these numbers by sur surveying our community caretakers in, in, in our area. And it comes to about a pound and a half a week or about a quarter of a pound a day per your average size cat, if you're just talking about dry food. So quarter pound a day, um, like a, uh, yeah, that'd be the best way to describe it. It'd be like a large cup would be enough for one cat for one day. If you're talking about canned food, it's it's a five and a half ounce can a day. So now if a cat's smaller or much larger than your average size cat, then you have to adjust accordingly. But um, that's often how, um, so for, we can do population estimates um, by monitoring how much cat food is being given. And that can get us pretty close to, to what the number of cats are using that quarter pound a day dry food uh, for formula. So there's a couple of questions about how to start a nonprofit out there. Um, just email me and I can get you, um, there was a presentation done on how to start a TNR program, which doesn't cover necessarily the how to start a nonprofit, but I think it's important for you to look at that in addition to, you know, you don't just start a nonprofit. I think you need to have an understanding of what that entails. What's that level of responsibility from a TNR perspective? So uh, just feel free to reach out to me and I can also get the, the, the general nonprofit setup information to you, as well as the access to the how to start a TNR program that, that Brian did along with um, Pat Dames of TNR Texas um, done several years ago, but I think it's still very valuable and current content. Um, so we're happy to share that information with uh, anyone who is interested. Brian, again, what a wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you so very, very much and appreciate it. We hope we'll see many of you at our December 2nd TNR certification workshop. Um, and congratulations to those who won CAT trivia. And we uh, will have you send, I'll send you access to the online CAT conference. The recording of this session will come out uh, in about five or six hours. So you'll see a link of that from um, GoToWebinar. And um, we'll also let you know when it's out on our YouTube page, but please subscribe to you, YouTube. If you need the handouts, you can email me. It's Stacy at CommunityCats Podcast. And anything else, Brian, you want to share with the group today? I just thank you. You know, thank you for, for because it is work and it, it, it's commitment and, um, you know, they're just understand you're not alone. There are literally millions of us in this country. Reach out and, and, and tap into that network. And uh, just thank you for the work you're doing every day. Excellent. Everybody, thank you so much for turning your passion for cats into action. And hopefully we'll see you on December 2nd. Uh, in